Hello, I'm Stephen Wolfram. This is going to be a tape about Mathematica. It'll be divided into two parts. First of all, I'll go quickly through and show you some of the things that Mathematica can do. And then we'll come back and look in more detail at Mathematica and see how you can use it to solve some of your own computational problems. So the main idea of Mathematica is to be a general tool for doing mathematical calculations. There are several different kinds of calculations that one needs to be able to do. Three basic kinds, numerical calculations, symbolic and algebraic calculations, and graphics. In numerical calculations, one's working with numbers, getting results that involve just numerical answers. In symbolic and algebraic computation, one's working directly with mathematical formulae, getting results that are in symbolic or algebraic form. And in graphical computation, one's visualizing the results of mathematical calculations, generating pictures to show mathematical functions and mathematical objects. Let me start off then by showing you quickly numerical calculations, symbolic and algebraic calculations, and graphics in Mathematica. Let's start off doing a very simple numerical calculation. OK, so we ask Mathematica to add 3 and 5 together. The basic mode of interacting with Mathematica, at least in its basic form, is this. You type in a question, Mathematica types back an answer. So here we've now asked Mathematica our first question, what's 3 plus 5? Mathematica will think for a very short amount of time and then give us the answer, it's 8. OK, let's try something a bit more difficult. Let's say we ask Mathematica to work out something like 3 to the power 1,000. Mathematica will think for a bit longer and then give us a much longer result. In this case, we'll have the exact answer for 3 to the power 1,000, which is a number that goes on for several screens. We can scroll back here to look for the beginning of that number. OK, we finally found it. OK, so that's a simple example of a numerical calculation done with Mathematica. Let's go on and look at some symbolic and algebraic calculations. We can start off by typing in an algebraic formula in Mathematica. Let's say we give Mathematica the formula 12 plus x plus x squared, all raised to the power 6. Here's the formula. Now we can manipulate this formula directly in algebraic form, not just in terms of the numbers that it might produce. So let's start off doing some algebraic computations with this formula. We could start by expanding the formula out. Here's the result. This is now a longer polynomial that we got by multiplying out these small, the small polynomial raised to the power 6. Now something that's algorithmically a lot more difficult is to take this result and factor it. Try and crunch it back down again to give our simple and original form. So if we ask Mathematica to factor this, it'll take it a little while, but eventually we'll get back that simple form we first typed in. Well, you can also use Mathematica to do calculus. Let's do a simple example of that. Let's say we ask Mathematica to integrate the expression x over x cubed minus 1. So we just say integrate x over x cubed minus 1 with respect to x. Then Mathematica will think for a little while and eventually give us the result here. It's a result that involves arctangents and logarithms and so on. It might have taken us a little while to come up with this by ourselves. OK, so there are a few examples of symbolic and algebraic calculations in Mathematica. Let's now turn to the third big class of computations that Mathematica tackles, namely graphical computations. Let's start off with a simple example here. Let's say we want to plot the tangent function of x with the variable x running from 0 to 10. So we tell Mathematica to do that plot. It'll think for a little while working out the values of the tangent function and eventually will give us this result. It will show us the form of the, the tangent function plotted as a function of x. Well, we can do not only two-dimensional graphs in Mathematica, but also three-dimensional ones. So, for example, I could tell Mathematica to plot the function sine of x times y with x running from 0 to 3 and y running from 0 to 3. Got cut off on the right-hand side of the screen here, but I can just move it over like that. 
OK, let's tell it to do this computation. It'll think for a while, working out some number of hundreds of points in the function sine of x times y, and eventually give us this result. If we scroll over a little bit, uh, we'll be able to see the thing. So there's some examples of graphics in Mathematica. We can actually do some pretty sophisticated graphics with Mathematica. Let me show you one example of that. We can take a function like the one we just produced, display it in color, and actually animate it by making a sequence of frames that correspond to the different pieces of a movie and then running them in quick succession. OK, so that pretty much finishes the quick run through the capabilities of Mathematica. So now we've gone quickly through the three basic kinds of computation that Mathematica does. Numerical computation, symbolic and algebraic computation, and graphics. Let's go back and look in a bit more detail at each of these areas. Let's start off with numerical computation. First thing to realize about Mathematica's numerical computation is that Mathematica can give you exact answers for numerical calculations, even when those involve a very large number of digits or involve, for example, rational approximations. So let's try an example of this. Let's say we ask Mathematica what's 4, four over 8 plus 1 over 7. What we'll get here is a rational number, 9 over 14, as the answer. This is the exact result for this computation. So similarly, if we ask Mathematica what's 3 to the power 200, it'll give us an exact answer to that calculation. In this case, it's a number, it's an integer that goes on for several lines. Now, in all cases, we can get a numerical approximation, a kind of fixed precision approximation to these numerical calculations by asking Mathematica explicitly to give us that. The notation is that percent stands for the last result you got, and the capital N function gives us a numerical approximation. So here, for example, we can ask for a numerical approximation to this exact result we had for 3 to the power 200. If we do that, we'll see that the answer, given now in scientific notation, is about 2.65 times 10 to the power 95. OK. So Mathematica knows about a large collection of mathematical functions. And in all cases, it can, if you want it, work out those functions to arbitrary pre numerical precision. Let's look at some examples of that. Let's say we want to work out square root of 19. There's no exact answer that we can get from, for that numerically, but we can get something that's approximate, and we can specify how many digits of accuracy we want Mathematica to keep in that numerical approximation. So in this case, we're asking Mathematica to work out the square root of 19 to 200 decimal places of accuracy. Let's try doing this. OK, after a short wait, uh, we'll see the result. It's about 4.35 and then a bunch of other digits. One thing that's kind of fun to do is to check that Mathematica actually got the right answer. Let's take this result that Mathematica gave us and square it again and see what we get. OK, this is encouraging. Things seem to be working. We get the answer 19 again. Well, one thing that's interesting from the point of view of numerical precision and numerical analysis is what happens if we take the result we just got and subtract the exact number 19 from it. Remember, what we did was to take the square root of 19, that's an exact quantity, then find a 200-place numerical approximation to it, and then square that numerical approximation. OK, so if we subtract from that approximation the exact result 19, we'll get a kind of residue that's of order 10 to the minus 200. In all cases, Mathematica kind of keeps track of the precision that can be justified in the answers that you're getting and shows you only that, those number of digits that can actually be justified on the basis of the history of the calculation. OK, so let's go on. We can also use complex numbers in Mathematica. The basic object that you need to deal with there is capital I, the square root of minus 1. So, for example, if I type in 3 plus 5i to the power 10, Mathematica can work that out and give us an exact complex number as the answer. Well, also, if you ask Mathematica what's a logarithm of minus 2.3, it will give us an answer for that that's stated as a complex number involving the quantity i. Mathematica has a pretty large repertoire of special functions of mathematical physics built into it. 
So for example, if we're interested in Bessel functions, we could ask Mathematica to do a calculation like this. We could ask it to work out J sub 2.5 of 5 plus 6i. And after a short delay, we'll get back an answer. I can't uh, verify immediately that this is right, but uh, I have great confidence in our program. And I think if you go to a book of tables, you'll find out that uh, uh, they'll say the same thing. It's a good check on the book of tables. OK, let's, let's go on. There's a really quite large collection of mathematical functions in Mathematica. So for example, you could even take a quite general function, like a hypergeometric function, and ask Mathematica to give you the numerical value for it. So let's do that here. Hypergeometric functions have quite a few arguments. This is the 2F1 hypergeometric function, which has a total of four arguments. So after a short delay, Mathematica will give us the result for the computation involving this hypergeometric function. Well, there are a whole lot of kinds of calculations that you can do numerically with Mathematica. Uh, another class of calculations are ones involving just integers. Let's take a look at a few of those. For example, you could ask Mathematica to factor an integer. Let's type in a sort of random integer. Now, after a short delay, Mathematica will show us the factors of this integer. They're 73 to the power 1, 137 to the power 1, and 2,341 to the power 1. Well, perhaps we can give it a slightly more difficult integer to factor. Let's work out 100 factorial, and then let's ask Mathematica to factor that as an integer. After a short delay, we'll see the result. We get here uh, a sequence of all of the primes starting at 2 and ending at 97. 2 appears 97 times, 97 appears just once. OK, so that's a little bit of numerical computation with Mathematica. Uh, a final thing to talk about in terms of numerical computation is dealing with vectors and matrices. So for example, we can type in a matrix in Mathematica. Let's say the matrix uh, 3, 4, minus 2, 7. A matrix in Mathematica is represented as a list of lists. Those curly brackets uh, show you where the lists begin and end. So with this matrix, we can now ask, for example, for the inverse of the matrix. And Mathematica will give us an exact result for that inverse, in this case in terms of rational numbers. We could also go, also go through and ask Mathematica to show us the eigenvalues of this matrix. It'll think for a little while and then give us the result, in this case involving complex numbers. Well, we could build some slightly bigger matrices. We can use the table command in Mathematica to construct a matrix with a particular form. So for example here, I'll construct a rather famous matrix, the so-called Hilbert matrix that we get by making a table of the expression 1 over i plus j plus 1, with i running up to 4 and j running up to 4. So let's construct that matrix. Here it is. Now we can do all kinds of computations with this matrix. So for example, we could take the inverse of this matrix, or we could take the determinant of that inverse, or we could do a whole variety of other things. We can also, for example, find the eigenvalues of that matrix now having taken a numerical approximation to the matrix. In fact, let's, for example, just find the eigenvalues of a numerical approximation to the matrix that appeared on the, the, the line immediately before last, which was the inverse of the Hilbert matrix. So now we can ask for those eigenvalues, and we'll get numerical approximations to each of them. OK, so that's uh, numbers in Mathematica. Second big class of computations that you can do with Mathematica are symbolic and algebraic ones. So let's now turn to talking about those. The idea is that you can type in an algebraic formula, something involving a symbolic variable like x, and manipulate it directly in algebraic form. So let's see that starting with a very, very simple example. If you type x plus x to Mathematica, it will tell you that that's equal to 2x. Let's try a more complicated example. Let's say that we ask Mathematica what's uh, x plus 1 times x plus 3. Well, it'll rearrange it a little bit 
but it won't, for example, expand out this expression. We can nevertheless tell it that we want to see this expression in its expanded form. We can explicitly use the Mathematica command expand, and now we can, when we do that, we'll see this, this expression expanded out into a sort of flat polynomial. We can use the Mathematica function factor to take this expanded form and reduce it back down to the form in which we first had it, where it uh, consists of a product of two factors. Okay, let's try some slightly more complicated examples. We could, for example, ask Mathematica to factor the expression x to the 16 minus 1. There's the factorization of it. If we now ask Mathematica to expand this, we'll get back the original form x to the 16 minus 1. So there are some very simple examples of doing algebra in Mathematica. An important point is that when you have a number, it's always stated in the same form. If you have two numbers that are equal, they certainly must look the same. With algebraic expressions, that isn't necessarily true. As we just saw, there can be an algebraic expression like x to the 16 minus 1, which can be stated both in its expanded form as x to the 16 minus 1, and in its factored form as a product of a number of factors. Well, that means that the problem of figuring out whether two algebraic expressions are equal is a more difficult one than working out whether two numbers are equal. And sometimes we'll have to use operations like expand and factor and so on to be able to work out whether two expressions are actually mathematically equal. Well, let's go on now and look at some other kinds of symbolic and algebraic operations that you can do with Mathematica. Another thing we can do is to solve equations. Let's take a simple example of that. Let's look at just a quadratic equation. So here I'm typing in the equation uh, x squared plus 2 times a times x plus 1 is equal to 0, and I'm asking Mathematica to solve that equation for x. Well, what I get as the result are these two roots. x is either this one form involving a or this other form down here involving a. One thing that's of mathematical interest is as follows. What happens if we ask Mathematica to solve an equation where there isn't a closed form solution that can be given, where there isn't a solution uh, that can be stated just in terms of square roots and cube roots and so on of numbers? So let's ask Mathematica to solve the fifth degree equation, x to the 5 plus 3x plus 1 equals 0, and see what happens. Well, it doesn't get very far with that equation. All it does is to tell us the root of that equation is the symbolic form that involves the function roots. However, following the sort of general principles of Mathematica, we could always tell Mathematica to take this symbolic form and now give us a numerical approximation to the results. Here's what we get. There's a sequence of pieces that correspond to the complex roots of that equation. So, for example, here we'll see an expression that, that uh, involves the square root of minus 1, capital I, and it's a formula for x in this numerical approximation. And then there are a sequence of other roots down here. Okay, so you can solve some pretty complicated equations with Mathematica. Let's try typing in a, a, a much more complicated one. A nonlinear set of coupled polynomial equations. First equation in the set is going to be the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. That's an equation for a circle. Now we can add another equation, say x cubed plus x times y plus y squared is equal to 0. Tell Mathematica to solve the, this pair of equations for the variables x and y. Mathematica will think for a little while, and then it will give us this result here, which isn't yet an actual solution to the equations, but it is a much simplified form of the equations. Mathematica uses a technique called Grobner basis reduction to try and simplify sets of equations and put them in a sort of triangular form. So here, for example, the first equation depends only on x, with a non-linearly on x and non-linearly on y, and the second equation down here uh, depends only on y. So the, uh, having got this kind of symbolic form, we can once again find a numerical approximation to our results. So here now we are asking Mathematica to take that symbolic form and find a numerical approximation. 
and after a little while it will give us a collection of real and complex roots to this equation, solutions for the parameters x and y. Well, another thing to know about solving equations in Mathematica is how, it, how Mathematica treats sort of subsidiary variables that may appear in the equation. For example, let's say we ask Mathematica to solve the equation ax plus b equals zero. Let's solve that for x. Well, what Mathematica will first give us is the kind of standard textbook answer for the solution to this equation. It will tell us that x is minus b over a. But one thing you might ask is, what does this solution mean when a is equal to zero? This isn't going to be meaningful in that particular case. So there's a more pedantic form of the solve function that you can use in Mathematica. Let's try that. Instead of asking Mathematica to solve the equation ax plus b equals zero for x, we'll just ask Mathematica to reduce that equation. Here's the result that we get in this case. We'll see a much more pedantic thing. Uh, what Mathematica will show us is that the result of reducing the equation has two possibilities. Either a is not equal to zero and x is equal to minus b over a, or a is equal to zero and b is equal to zero. Well, in general, we can do this kind of thing and find out what the non-generic solutions to equations are as well as the generic ones in Mathematica. So much for algebra in Mathematica. Let's now turn to another topic. Let's talk about doing calculus with Mathematica. Let's start off with a simple example of calculus. Let's tell Mathematica to integrate the function x to the n with respect to x. Here's the result we get. As we know, that integral is x to the 1 plus n divided by 1 plus n. OK, let's try a more difficult integral. Let's ask Mathematica to integrate the function uh, x over x cubed minus 1 with respect to x. Now, it'll take Mathematica a little bit longer to think about this, but eventually we'll get the answer. It's something involving logarithms and arc tangents and so on. Now, it's interesting to see what happens if we take this expression and now differentiate it again with respect to x and compare it with that original form, x over x cubed minus 1, that we started with. Let's try doing this. We tell Mathematica to differentiate the thing it has with respect to x. What we get is something that should be mathematically equal to x over x cubed minus 1, but in this particular case, it didn't happen to get stated in exactly the same algebraic form. Well, there's a function in Mathematica called simplify that works like this. It takes an algebraic expression and it tries a sequence of different transformation rules on that expression and gives us back as a result whatever answer it got that was the simplest one from trying any of those algebraic transformations. So let's try it in this case. It'll think for a while trying a bunch of different transformations and eventually it gives us back this answer which we can readily recognize as being equal to the original form we had. Okay, let's try asking Mathematica to do a few other integrals. Mathematica has a pretty big table of integrals built into it, and as time goes on, we make the table of integrals included in, with Mathematica bigger and bigger. Here's an example of something that got done by looking up some rules in the table of integrals that Mathematica has. We asked Mathematica to integrate logarithm of logarithm of x with respect to x. The answer in this case came out in terms of a function called the logarithmic integral function, which is a special function of mathematical physics that Mathematica knows about. OK, let's turn to some other kinds of calculus-related symbolic operations that you can do with Mathematica. Let's talk about power series expansion. When you work with uh, numbers, it's very important in many cases to be able to have a floating point number, to be able to have a number that's a kind of approximation to the exact number you're working with and that is maintained to a particular degree of precision. Well, there's an analog of approximate floating point numbers for algebraic formulae. The analog is power series. We can ask Mathematica, for instance, to find a power series expansion for e to the x times sine 2x about the point x equals 0 to sixth order in x. Here's the result that we get. Now, we can take this power series form and manipulate it, applying, for example, exponentiation functions to it and so on. 
Mathematica will always make sure that it gives us back an answer that's an, another approximate algebraic expression that, again, is produced to the degree of algebraic precision that can be justified on the basis of the calculations we've done so far. So let's, for instance, ask Mathematica to work out the exponential of this function. Here's the answer. Again, it's a power series, but it's worked out just to order x to the seventh. The only that that's as precise as we could justify on the basis of the sort of history of this computation. If we take the logarithm of this power series, we'll get back again the power series that we first worked out. Well, Mathematica can also handle power series of purely formal functions, functions like f of x, rather than things like sine of x or exponential of x. Let's try that out. So here's a form that involves the function f. We put in f of h plus x minus f of x minus h divided by 2h. You'll probably recognize that this is a sort of finite difference approximation to a, the derivative of the function f. We can see that explicitly by asking Mathematica to work out the power series expansion for this form as a function of h about the, expanded about the point h equals 0 to sixth order. Let's do that. What we see here is a sequence of terms. The first term involves f prime of x, the first derivative of f evaluated at x. Then there's a term involving the third derivative of f multiplied by h squared, the fifth derivative of f multiplied by h to the fourth, and so on. So here we see that Mathematica was able to treat the function f in a purely formal fashion and work out this power series symbolically in terms of it. Let me show you a little bit more about how that actually works. One of the big issues is what happens if you ask Mathematica to work out the derivative of, derivative of f of x squared with respect to x. Here's what you get as an answer. The answer, Mathematica uses the chain rule to write this derivative as 2x multiplied by f prime evaluated at the point where its argument is equal to x squared. Actually, if you want to see what's really going on here, you can always ask Mathematica to show you the full form of this expression. Now we'll see explicitly that this is a product of 2 and x, and this thing here that's a derivative functional acting on f, and that resulting function applied to the second power of x. OK. so. So much for symbolic and algebraic computation in Mathematica. Let's now turn to the third big area that Mathematica tackles, namely graphics. Let's start off by plotting some simple functions uh, in Mathematica. Let's ask Mathematica to plot secant of x, sec of x, as a function of x from 0 to 10. Program will think for a little while and eventually give us a picture of that secant function. Now, there are a number of technical things that it's important to say about these pictures produced in Mathematica. One of them is that all the pictures are represented in a graphics description language called PostScript which is the language that's used, for example, by the Apple Laser Writer and by many other kinds of printers and display devices. One important aspect to PostScript is that it's a resolution-independent way of describing graphics. That means that if I take this picture and resize it, make it bigger, for instance, I can have Mathematica draw the picture at any resolution, at any size. I could also, if I wanted to, take this picture and actually look at the... Uh, uh, postscript that lies behind um, the actual graphic image here. We can take the graphics and actually see the postscript representation of it, the kind of textual description that lies behind the image that we had. Postscript language is a great language, but it's in many respects a lot more obscure than Mathematica, so don't be put off by how complicated this looks. Nevertheless, since uh, 
I happen to know the postscript language, if I can find it, I can actually go in and edit this postscript and uh, modify the appearance of the picture that we had there. So let me go in and uh, change a couple of lines of the postscript code that describes that picture. And then let me go ahead and uh, tell Mathematica to redisplay the picture using this modified postscript. So as you see, what happened is that we made the line a bunch thicker and turned it red. Now, what's important here uh, is that you can take the postscript description of a graphic that's produced by Mathematica and you can take it and transport it to a whole bunch of other kinds of media. So for example, you could take the graphic, send it to a printer of any kind of resolution and have it print out at the resolution of that printer. Or you could take the graphic and you can paste it into something like a desktop publishing program. You can put it into that program in encapsulated postscript form so that it maintains its resolution independence and clarity uh, even in that medium. Okay, well, let's, let's go on and look at some other kinds of graphics in Mathematica. One thing you might wonder about is how does Mathematica fare if you ask it to plot a function that's really quite difficult to plot, like sine 1 over x. See, the problem with that function is that when x is close to 0, 1 over x gets very large, and sine 1 over x wiggles infinitely often. So the question is, what's Mathematica going to do in a case like this? Well, first of all, it complains a bit and says that you're trying to divide by zero. But after it's through complaining, it will produce a result. Here's what it produces. What happened here is that Mathematica goes in when it finds that the function is wiggling a lot and samples more points in the evaluation of the function to try and track all of those wiggles that are happening. And it does a pretty reasonable job at that. Uh, it'll look, this picture looks very much like what the final function sine 1 over x would look like. Now, there are all sorts of knobs and switches that you can set to determine just exactly how graphics is produced by Mathematica in cases like this. For example, you can tell Mathematica to spend more time and track those wiggles more accurately, or perhaps spend less time, track the wiggles less accurately. Let's look, for example, at exactly what the options to the plot function are. There's a long list of them. Here's just a few. You can tell Mathematica to plot the uh, a uh, picture with a different aspect ratio, the default is the 1 over the golden ratio, or with different numbers of points to start off with, and so on. The general policy that Mathematica follows is to use a, a sensible set of defaults, which will work most of the time, but if you happen to want to tweak things to get it just right for your particular case, you can go in and reset these options so that you can get something that's optimal for your particular case. Well, Mathematica uses the same kind of approach when it does three-dimensional graphics. Let's get a picture of uh, a three-dimensional function. We'll ask Mathematica to, find, to make a picture of uh, the imaginary part of the secant function of x plus i, y, with x running from minus 3 to 3 and y running from minus 3 to 3. And we'll kind of set a special option here to tell Mathematica when it gets a surface that represents this function, shade it using some simulated lighting algorithm so as to add some sort of color to that surface. So it'll think for a little while here and eventually generate a picture uh, of this function. And we'll see that that picture contains color that represents the, the color that you would get if you had three light sources shining from the right-hand side of the image uh, onto the surface. Now again, there are all sorts of knobs and switches that you can set here. For example, you might ask Mathematica to show the surface from a different point of view. Let's say from the viewpoint 4, 5, minus 7. So now Mathematica will redisplay the surface from that new viewpoint. What we've done, I guess, is to turn the thing over and look at it from underneath. There's some kinds of computers on which you can do this kind of thing in real time. Computers like silicon graphics machines or ardent or stellar machines that have real-time three-dimensional graphics hardware allow you to pick up a picture like this and actually rotate it around with the mouse or with a joystick and see the image move in real time. One of the things that's very interesting about the way that Mathematica deals with three-dimensional graphics is the fact that you can mix the kind of symbolic capabilities of Mathematica with its graphical ones. 
in particular, you can take the sort of geometrical description of a three-dimensional object given as a kind of symbolic, in symbolic form, and you can then tell Mathematica to render that geometrical description as an actual image. Let's look at an example of that. Let me read in a file called polyhedra.m. This is a file that contains a bunch of definitions of the uh, geometrical properties of three-dimensional polyhedra. Well, having now read this file in, I can use the functions that are defined in it. So, for example, I can take uh, the function dodecahedron, which is a function that returns a sort of symbolic description of a dodecahedron object. And then I can tell Mathematica to show that as a piece of three-dimensional graphics. So here's what I get in this case. Uh, it's a three-dimensional image of a dodecahedron. Let's try another example of that. This is one of my favorite examples. Uh, you can ask Mathematica to take an icosahedron, a 20-sided, 20 20-faced 20 polyhedron, um, and tell it to stellate that, take the sort of symbolic description of the icosahedron, and glue a tetrahedron onto each face, and then take the resulting object and show it as a piece of three-dimensional graphics. So after a little while here, we'll see the result from that. Uh, it's a three-dimensional object that uh, is, as always, produced in a resolution-independent fashion. So in places where one face comes across in front of another one, Mathematica will sort of solve exactly for the places where the faces intersect and will give us a representation in the postscript of that exact intersection. Even if faces stick through each other like that, uh, you'll find that Mathematica will solve exactly for the appropriate intersections and give you the right results. Now, as always, because this is a resolution-independent piece of postscript graphics, you can take it and you can resize it any way you want. Let's make this picture very big. Now we can just see on the screen a part of the image of our stellated icosahedron, but we'll notice that all of the hidden surface elimination and so on is still done in an exactly appropriate fashion. So there's some three-dimensional graphics in Mathematica. As well as doing kind of graphical output in Mathematica, we can also do some forms of graphical input. Let me show you an example of that. Let's first of all plot a simple sine curve. We'll tell Mathematica to plot sine x in the range 0 to 2 pi. Here's the result. Now, if I hold down the appropriate key here, I can have Mathematica show me in real time a display of the coordinates in this picture that I'm picking out with the mouse. If I want to, I can actually go on and uh, kind of scribble on this picture. I can draw in my approximation to a sine curve. Now I can take the coordinates that were in my approximation to the sine curve and I can read them into Mathematica. So there are all the coordinates that came from the points that I clicked in to Mathematica here. Let me scroll over to the side of these coordinates. And then I'll read these coordinates into Mathematica and we'll be able to do computations with them. OK, so let's call the sequence of data that we clicked in data. Now we can do things with this data list of data. For example, we could tell Mathematica to make a plot of that list of data. So after a little while, we'll see here a slightly nicer form of that sequence of points that we clicked in. Now, for example, we could tell Mathematica to give us a fit to that data. So, for example, we could say, fit the data to some linear combination of the functions 1, x, x squared, and x to the fourth. What we get out here is an approximate formula that represents the best fit we could get in a least squares fashion, uh, given that sequence of functions that we were asking it to fit with. Well, now, for example, we could take uh, this fitted form, and we could plot that and see how it compares with the thing we started from. So after a little while, we'll get out the result of plotting that fit. So now we can take the fit that we produced and combine it with the actual data that we started off with and show the two together. Here we go. So the fit wasn't too bad. 
Okay, so now we've gone through some of the aspects of graphics in Mathematica. The next big thing to talk about is how you program Mathematica. What we've shown so far is primarily using Mathematica like a very much enhanced calculator. You type in a, a question, whether it be numerical, symbolic, or graphical, and Mathematica prints back the answer. You can also use Mathematica in a somewhat more advanced way as a programming language. You can teach Mathematica new kinds of mathematical knowledge. You can show it new kinds of mathematical objects, build in new kinds of algorithms, and use those to do more advanced sorts of calculations. The, so there are several different styles of programming that you can use in Mathematica. The first style of programming is something a little bit like what you might be used to from a language like C or Pascal or Fortran or BASIC. It's a kind of procedural programming. The idea there is that you show Mathematica in a step-by-step -step fashion how to execute some kind of algorithm. You might have loops and conditionals and things like that. All the traditional kinds of constructs in programming languages that are the so-called structured or procedural programming languages. Now it turns out that some things work a lot more nicely in Mathematica than they do in those more traditional languages. You see the primitives in Mathematica are much higher level than in those other languages. It's a primitive in Mathematica to take the GCD of two numbers or to uh, work out the eigenvalues of a matrix. So you don't have to go back to a lower level and build up those operations from scratch. You can take those operations for granted and build on top of those operations more advanced kinds of algorithms and so on. Another thing that turns out to be a big advantage of Mathematica as far as procedural programming is concerned is the interactive nature of the system. As soon as you've typed in the definition of a function, you can immediately execute that function and see what answers you get. You don't have to go through the step of first compiling your function into some kind of internal machine code and only then actually executing it and seeing what answers you get. A second aspect of Mathematica that's very convenient in doing procedural programming is the symbolic nature of the system. If you're using a language like Fortran, for instance, you'll typically have to say right up front that some particular array A, for instance, is of length 12. In Mathematica, you don't have to do anything like that. In Mathematica, you just say A is a list, and you can go on adding elements or subtracting elements from that list however you want. You don't have to have already sort of declared up front that A is going to be a list of length 12. You can just let the thing grow and shrink dynamically as the program runs, because all sizes of lists are equally good symbolic expressions. It turns out, in fact, that we're seeing an awful lot of users of Mathematica prototyping algorithms using Mathematica. They write, it's a lot faster to write many, many kinds of algorithms in Mathematica than in a traditional language like C, Pascal, or Fortran. If you really, really are wanting to run your algorithm a million times, it may be better at some time to take the final form of your algorithm and rewrite it in a language like C or Pascal uh, because that way you can actually have the thing executed at exactly as fast as the machine you're running on will let it go. If you run in Mathematica because it's a much higher level system, it won't run as fast for doing kind of low level operations as a compiled language would. On the other hand, one thing you can do with Mathematica is to set it up as a kind of control system controlling an external C or Fortran or Pascal program. So you set up your calculations in Mathematica, then kind of send off the commands to your external program, let the external program crunch for a while, and then get the results back into Mathematica for analysis, graphics, or whatever else. So the second major style of programming in Mathematica is functional programming, essentially in the tradition of APL. Uh, like APL, you can, with Mathematica, set up lists and tensors and arrays and manipulate them with a variety of functions. Unlike APL, Mathematica spells out all of the commands it uses, doesn't use any of those strange symbols. And also, it's somewhat generalized from the way that APL works by including symbolic functions as well as numerical ones. The third major style of programming in Mathematica, perhaps the most important one, is one that tries to take something that you can translate directly from tables of mathematical formulae and so on. If you look at a table of mathematical formulae, what you'll typically see is a sequence of results which say, if you have a mathematical formula of this form, 
it can get transformed into something of this form. So we tried to mimic that in Mathematica and give one a way to just specify a sequence of transformation rules for mathematical expressions. Let me show you some examples of this. Let's start off with something very simple. Let's start off trying to define a factorial function in Mathematica. The first thing that we might do is to give Mathematica the rule that factorial of 1 is equal to 1. Okay, so having given it that rule, if we now ask Mathematica what's factorial of 1, it'll very correctly tell us, using the rule that we just specified, that factorial of 1 is equal to 1. But if we now ask what's factorial of 12, Mathematica won't know that. It will just tell us for right now factorial of 12 is equal to factorial of 12. It doesn't yet know a transformation rule that allows it to transform fact of 12 into anything different. Well, we can add a rule that would allow us to transform that. We can tell Mathematica the general rule for what's fact of n, what's fact of anything. The underscore there we call blank and represents in Mathematica any expression. So this is now saying fact of any expression, blank, that expression is named n, is equal to fact of n times fact of n minus 1. Okay, so now we've given a second rule for the factorial function. Having done that, we can ask Mathematica what's fact of 20. It'll now give us the result, and we can compare that with a built-in factorial function and see that it actually did get the right answer. We can ask Mathematica now what the complete set of rules that it knows for the factorial function is. What we'll see is two rules, the two that we gave it. One says fact of 1 is 1. The other one says in the general case for any expression blank, fact of n is n times fact of n minus 1. Okay, so that's how we would define a factorial function using sort of rule-based programming in Mathematica. Let me now show you another example of how one can use rule-based programming. Let's say that we want to set up our own version of a logarithm function in Mathematica. Well, there's a built-in logarithm function whose name starts with a capital L. But let me now put in my own logarithm function whose name is going to start with a lowercase l. Well, right now, Mathematica doesn't know anything about that logarithm function that I've just started using. Uh, so, for example, if I say enter the expression log of some product of terms, Mathematica won't yet know that that log of a product is equal to a sum of logarithms. Well, I can give it a rule that would tell it that. I can explicitly say log of x blank times y blank is equal to log x plus log y. So now, having given that rule, I can go back and ask Mathematica to look at this expression again. What it'll now do is to use the rule I just specified to expand the expression out and to write that log of a product as a sum of logarithms. Well, now, for example, I might want to go down here and add another rule about logarithms. I might want now to tell Mathematica that log of x blank to the power n blank is equal to log n times log x. So having done that, I can go back up here and ask Mathematica to look at this expression again. And what I'll see is that Mathematica can now expand the whole thing out and write it in terms of logs of individual symbols. So what I did here then was to teach Mathematica a couple of rules about this new logarithm function that I added. I gave it this, these two kind of standard textbook rules for logarithm functions. And in general, you can go through and make a whole sequence of rules to teach Mathematica about some new kind of mathematical function or some new kind of mathematical object. Let me finish off this section by showing one more example of that kind of thing. Let's say you wanted to define something for doing abstract algebra, for instance. You wanted to define a g-type object. And this g-type object is supposed to have the property that g of x blank plus g of y blank is equal to g of x plus y. Well, one question is, when we put in this rule, what object is that rule going to be associated with? If we try and type this rule in the form we have it here, what we'll be doing is to tell Mathematica to associate that rule with the operation of addition, with the object plus. That's probably not a very good idea, and Mathematica will show us that by giving us uh, a warning that says that the symbol plus is right protected. You see, in Mathematica, you can override anything that was built into Mathematica. So, for example, if you wanted to, you could tell Mathematica that 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. 
that probably wouldn't be a very good idea. And Mathematica tries to protect itself against that kind of thing by setting it up initially for symbols like plus, the addition operation, to be right protected. You can always unprotect them, and then you're on your own. Well, actually, in this expression that we were working with here, it probably would have been a lot better to try and associate this rule not with the plus operation, but with the object G. So then we're doing a kind of thing that's a bit like object-oriented programming uh, in setting up rules that are associated with the objects that operations act on rather than the operations themselves. So now I put in this rule and told Mathematica to associate the rule with G. And now if we ask what does it know about G, it will show us this rule that uh, shows how the addition operation acts on G objects. Well now I can actually type in some expression involving G objects and Mathematica will go ahead and use the rule that we entered um, and squash down the sum of G objects into G of a sum of objects. Now you'll notice that in doing this, Mathematica had to match a number of patterns. It had to notice that somewhere in that sum of four G type objects, there was something that was in the form G of X blank plus G of Y blank. It had to use that match that pattern and use the transformation rule we had defined for that pattern to reduce the sequence of G type terms down, eventually giving this final result that we have. Okay, so that's a little bit on how to program in Mathematica. One of the very important aspects of Mathematica is that it's a very open system. It has many ways in which it can interact with the outside computer environment. So, for example, you can take results that you get from Mathematica and feed them straight into other systems. We already saw how you can do that with graphics. You can take postscript graphics images and paste them into other programs. You can do that with other things, too. For example, let's say that we've got an algebraic expression as a result from a Mathematica calculation. We can now take that expression and, for example, uh, write it in a form that's appropriate for input to the tech typesetting system. So now we take this tech form of the expression and we can splice it into a document so as to get beautiful typeset output for our formula. Or we could take this formula that we worked out with Mathematica and prepare it for input to a Fortran program. We could write it in Fortran form and we could then take this expression and splice it into the middle of a Fortran program. Actually, one way that quite a few people use Mathematica is as a system for controlling and interpreting the results from external programs. The basic idea is as follows. You build up interactively within Mathematica code that sets up the parameters you want for a particular run of one of your old Fortran programs or something. Uh, having set up all of those parameters, you then feed them, typically through a pipe, to the external Fortran program that's running as a separate process. The Fortran program then does its thing, gets back some results, which you can then read into Mathematica for further analysis or graphics or whatever. So that's a common mode of interaction with Mathematica, that you set it up to kind of cooperate uh, with um, uh, an external program that's um, uh, running outside of Mathematica. One thing I should mention is something about the software engineering of Mathematica. One of our goals in building Mathematica was to make a standard tool that could work on a whole variety of different computer environments. Now, of course, different computer environments have very different user interface characteristics. What we did to overcome this problem was to break Mathematica into two parts, a kernel and a front end. The kernel of, the math of Mathematica, which is the part that actually does mathematical computations, is set up to work exactly the same on all the different machines that run Mathematica. The front end, on the other hand, is set up in a way that's specially optimized for each particular machine. Right now, for instance, we've built special front ends that run on Macintoshes and Next computers and take advan advantage of the sophisticated window kits that exist on those machines. One of the things you can do, because the kernel and the front end are separated in the way that they are, is actually to run the, those two parts on separate computers. So, for example, you could run the kernel of Mathematica on one machine, a sort of remote compute server uh, cruncher, and then run the front end for Mathematica on your local small 
graphically oriented machine such as a Macintosh. And you could have the two things talking to each other over a network in a completely transparent fashion. Now another thing that's important from the point of view of this breaking of Mathematica into a kernel on a front end is ways that you can build applications that sit on top of Mathematica. As I've discussed, Mathematica is a language in which you can write application packages for solving specific classes of problems. Well, one thing you can do, as well as writing an application package that's in the Mathematica language and using it directly within a standard Mathematica session, is that you can actually build your own front end for Mathematica and glue that onto the Mathematica system. So, for example, if you have an operation to do where, where you've coded up a package in Mathematica, but the specification of that operation can be done much more simply than actually typing in general Mathematica commands, then you could build a special front end that deals with that simpler form of input for your operations. So, for instance, you could build a front end for Mathematica that just displays five buttons on the screen and allows the user simply to push the button that they want to do the particular operation they're interested in. What happens behind that front end is that you prepare packets of input for Mathematica, then send them through the protocol between the front end and the kernel, have them evaluated by the kernel, have the computations done by the kernel, and then send the results back to the front end for display in whatever way you want. So there are a very large number of different application areas where Mathematica can be used both in a direct fashion, typing commands directly into Mathematica, and by using custom front ends that have been built to work specifically with those particular commands. So that's the end of our short introduction to Mathematica. This introduction has really only scratched the surface of the Mathematica system. There's much more to say about the way that you program Mathematica, the way that mathematical operations are set up in Mathematica, and many other things. Of course, the only way you'll really learn about a computer system like Mathematica is by actually using it. I hope you'll enjoy using Mathematica.